Uh, can we all just pray first? Lord, we once again thank you for this day and all the members that are here. And I ask that you be with all the members that are away, whether they be traveling or in their homes, that you'd be with them and that you'd carry this message to them. Lord, we thank you for all that you've given us, for sacrificing yourself for us, and for your holy word, Lord, that we are about to read from. I ask that you humble my heart as I read it, that you would be with Dennis as he preaches and teaches from it, and that your spirit would move through each one of us to hear it, and to take it out those doors and live it. That we would be examples, not just to the world, but to other brothers and sisters. We love you, Lord, and thank you for your word. The church in Laodicea. Now I will say, I hope we are not like this church. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot, or that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing not realizing that you're a wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will, come t I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. As I also conquered sin, sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Thank you, Corey. <clears throat> Guess I don't need that, do I? <laughs> so um, <clears throat> uh, it looks a little unbalanced here. It seems like the McLarens take up a lot of room over here, and, and uh, with them missing this morning, they're up in Edmonton, and uh, that's the reason I'm here, and Sherman's not. So I. I first want to say I struggled a lot with this lesson. And I kept asking myself the question personally to me, am I lukewarm? I, I, it just seemed like as you go th went through that, I thought, well, am I lukewarm? Am I lukewarm? But I want you to just look up here. So uh, Ephesus, the church in Ephesus, we talked about Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis. Philadelphia, and now we're on the seventh church, the last church, is the church in Laodicea. <clears throat> so Laodicea, a little bit of history, was, was a very wealthy city during the Roman period. And not only was Laodicea located on a major trade route that connected it to Ephesus and Smyrna and Sardis, but it was also a center of textile production and banking. So, uh, as we'll see in the Bible, and as, as we read this morning, they were a wealthy church. They were a wealthy church. <clears throat> if you have a red letter edition, you'll notice that the writing of each of these churches is in red. And that means that this is Jesus speaking. So these are Jesus' words that are being relayed to John, and John is putting them down in a letter and relating to the churches. In verse 14, it said that Jesus is the ruler 
of God's creation. I think in the, the translation that Corey used, it talked about like he was there in the beginning. He was actually the creator as well as the ruler of all creation. <clears throat> in all the, the letters we've seen the, in the beginning, it says <clears throat> in the introduction, as in the introduction of all the churches, you'll notice that John is asked to write the letter to the angel of the church. And so, as I look back on this word, it can mean messenger or it can mean elder. So, uh, if he was writing this letter to certainly a messenger or, or to an elder in the church, that would make a lot of sense as we think about that. <clears throat> so, as he begins... He says the Amen, and, and this is actually Jesus. It's a word for Jesus, the Amen. And if you think about it, <clears throat> and as you look at this word, it's, it means to agree fully that something is true. So could we say that what I'm saying, Jesus is saying that what I'm saying is fully I agree fully to what it is and that it is true. I agree fully to what, it say, what I'm saying and it is true. So he goes on again now in verse 15 to the real issue here that he's talking to the church. And he says, you're not hot or cold. I wish that you were hot or cold, he says. But because you are lukewarm, you're neither hot nor cold. I am ready to spit you out of my mouth. So this idea of cold, <clears throat> uh, the word uh, kind of gives the indication, you know, like they're giving the cold shoulder to Jesus. So if you think about the cold sh shoulder that they were ignoring, it's like ignoring someone deliberately, cold shoulder. So they were ignoring Jesus deliberately and he says to the church, you're not cold. Isn't that interesting? He says, you're not cold. As I got to the next part of the lesson, I, I began to realize that, and talking about hot, I began to realize that I was asking the wrong question. <laughs> it wasn't whether I was lukewarm, but the question was, was I hot? Was I hot? I, and, and so in Romans 12... Verse 11, Paul encourages the Romans to never be lacking in zeal. So those would be the cold people, right? Never lacking in zeal. Don't lack in zeal, he's saying. But, he says, keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. So we could say that's, that's being hot. And Jesus says to the church in Laodicea, again, he says, you're neither cold or hot. And the meaning of the word hot is exactly what Paul's saying, never lacking in spiritual zeal or spiritual fervor, I think is one of the terms to use. And so if we think about this, these words and this word hot, it's pronounced zeal, and it literally means boiling with interest or desire. Boiling with interest or desire. To be deeply committed to something. To be earnest. To set one's heart on. To be completely intent upon. And so there's commitment in this focus. They're totally, it's like totally everything that's a part of their life. Now Paul, I believe in, in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 2 to 5, talks to about the churches in Macedonia. And, and he's talking about them as a real example of what it's like to be hot. And he says, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded 
with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. So let's just take a look and see <clears throat> why the Macedonian churches were hot. So the first one is, it says, is they gave themselves first to the Lord. Now think about that. What, how would you do that? Well, in my thinking, they probably stopped to pray about it before they did it. They stopped to think about and pray about what, was, what would God want us to do and how can we do this? And so prayer, to me, is a huge part. In other words, it's, they showed their reliance on God not on themselves. The next thing is they gave beyond their ability. Now think about that. In my thinking, that means they had this tremendous faith and trust in God that he could do beyond what they could do and their expectations. <clears throat> they pleaded, it says, for the privilege of sharing. So you know, think about somebody pleading. Well, isn't that, isn't that like boiling with desire? Isn't this the, the idea of this passion that they had for what they wanted to do for, in this situation? And then it says they exceeded their expectations. They exceeded the expectations that, that they had for the church, the Macedonian churches. And so... It would seem to me that they had really set their heart on the task. They set their heart on the task. And so he says to the church in Laodicea, he says, uh, you're not hot, <laughs> but I wish you were. I wish you were. So let's take a moment to look at this word lukewarm. And the question is, are, are you a lukewarm Christian? And, and so... <clears throat> you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, and I'm ready to spit you out of my mouth. So the word lukewarm is translated as the condition uh, of, a, of a soul that actually is, is fluctuating. It's this idea, one of the words used is topar and the other is fervor. So topar means a lack of enthusiasm, and fervor is a passion. Or love. So these people were fluctuating back and forth. They couldn't make up their minds. They were, there was no real commitment to one thing. And of course, what we always often say is they were sitting on the fence, right? They couldn't make up, they couldn't, they were, well, <clears throat> let's just look and see what James says. He says, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. In Proverbs, it says, for the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. So Jesus then says, he says, because you're lukewarm, I'm ready to spit you out of my mouth. I want you to think about this word. It comes from a verb uh, in the Greek, imahio. I'm not sure if that's the right pronunciation or not, but, but it means to vomit. It means to reject with extreme disgust. And here's the only place that actually this verb is used in the New Testament. So, and Jesus says, I am ready to spit you out of my mouth. I'm ready to vomit. So wouldn't you get the impression here that God finds lukewarm pretty repulsive? Pretty repulsive about being lukewarm. And so that was the first thing I remember saying to Danny and Sherman. I says, I don't want to be, lu after looking at this thing, I do not want to be lukewarm. <laughs> I don't want him spitting me out of his mouth. But you know, Jesus really doesn't have a lot of good things to say to the church in Laodicea. The first thing he says, they become wealthy. And, and that means actually that they have actually more than they need. Think about that. They have more than they need. And so, as we think about this, uh, the, there's a commentary that I read and I thought was really interesting how he, 
He talked about this. He said the Laodiceans had success in banking, trade, and commerce, but their spiritual lives paid low spiritual dividends or yields. The Laodiceans were too highly motivated or conscientious about earthly matters and lacked a real spiritual commitment for wise prioritizing. In short, I think he's saying they didn't think they had any need for anything else, including Jesus. And so Christ, oh, jumping ahead. <laughs> the next thing they say is, is, he says is, you are wretched. You are wretched. And so literally here again, it, this idea of literally they were full of calluses. Uh, you, can you think about that? They were full of calluses, like, like you get hardened, right, on your hands. When you have calluses, they get tough. And he says they were deep in deep misery because of that. Now they probably, they just think about that. They thought they had everything. They had a thought they had it made. And he's saying, you're in deep misery. You don't know. And so <clears throat> we might say that they had hardened their hearts. And he goes on and he says, you're pitiful. <laughs> you're pitiful. And so as I looked at this word, it means in great need of mercy. They were in great need of mercy. And so when you think about that definition of mercy, which I've come up with over the years, that really makes sense to me, that mercy is the compassion for the misery of sin. They needed mercy. They needed compassion. And they needed to have that even in their lives. And they didn't have it. He says, you're blind. <laughs> you are blind. They didn't really see what they really needed, is really what he's saying here. They couldn't see what they needed. They were totally blind to that. And the idea here was... Uh, Oh, I, I didn't put blind up there, did I? They didn't see what they really needed. Uh, poor, I guess, I, I'm not sure if I talked about poor, but that was complete, they completely were lacking in resources. In other ways, they didn't have what they really needed. They thought they did, but they really didn't have what they really needed to survive and to live in the world. And the last thing he says is, you are naked. And that's defined as unclad or without clothing. But I think Paul, in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 5, explains this so much better than I can. And he says, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands, Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we're clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened. Because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this purpose is God, who has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Yesterday, uh, while Sherman and Ann were writing their English exam, uh, Karen and I were in a workshop on suicide prevention and self-harm. And one of the things in that whole thing that kept coming out to me if, if I was going to be talking to somebody who had that idea was, was I needed to give them hope. I needed to give them hope. And Jesus <clears throat> here, I believe, now is he going to try and give the Laodiceans hope. Just like he does with us, right? Right? Jesus gives us hope. 
So Jesus is telling them that they don't have the kind of riches and they don't have the kind of clothes that they need to be wearing. He says, so what I want you to do is I want you to buy from me. I want you to buy from me refined gold to become rich and white clothes to wear. He says, cover your nakedness. Put salve on your eyes so you can see. And Christ, as we know, and as he says, corrects and punishes those that he loves. Think about that. He corrects and punishes those that he loves. So be eager to do right, he says, and change, change your hearts and lives. Repent. Be earnest, he says. And so that was the other thing that we talked a lot about, was giving other options that they, they had to make changes. In other words, a lot of these things, uh, the lady that was teaching and had a great deal of experience, she was very, very good. But one of the things she said is, these are behaviors that need to be changed. These are behaviors that need to be changed. And I think that's exactly what Christ is saying to the Laodiceans. These behaviors need to change. What you're doing needs to change. And so... He goes on in Romans 5 and 2 to 5 and he says, We boast or rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame or disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So, are not the riches that Jesus is talking about exactly what Paul's saying here? We struggle, but when we clothe ourselves with Christ, we can overcome. And here's the reward, he says. Here's the reward. Verse 20. Here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with you. And you will eat with me. Think about that. What a great relationship, you know, to just sit down with Jesus and, and eat together. You know, we often say that's when the best fellowship happens, when we sit down and eat. And so just think about that. What a great relationship we can have when we open the door and he knocks and we open the door. So Jesus is saying, I'm not asking you to do anything that I am not willing to do or have done. Think about that. I'm not asking you. He's not asking you. He's not asking me to do anything that he hasn't already done. And so he says in verse 21, those who win the victory, those who win the victory will sit with me on my throne in the same way that I won the victory and sat down with my father on his throne. Listen to what the Spirit says. Everyone who has ears, let him hear, should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches.